Hey, we've obviously had a lot of success with our businesses over the last few years. But one thing we don't talk about enough is how much failure has been involved. If you've ever started a business or ever even thought about it, you're doing more than most people. And that's incredible. Only 2% of people actually get off their butt and try. And you're part of that 2%. But sometimes our thoughts can scare us away from big goals. Maybe you've thought that you're not good enough to run a business or you're not the right type of person to run a business. And I want you to know that those thoughts are not true. If we can do it, anyone can do it. But social media paints this picture that starting and running a business is easy. And that's a lie. Most overnight success stories take at least 10 years to develop. We're hoping to document our long journey for everyone here on YouTube. And today we want to share with you the lessons from four of our biggest failures that we've had in running our little furniture business that we hope one day will be the next big furniture brand. You'll have to let us know which one of the four failures resonates with you the most. Okay, let's jump in. Hi, we're Jenny and Davis. We always try to keep it real with y'all. Running a business is hard. It is failure after failure after failure, and then magically something works, and you don't know why, but you keep doing it <laughs> over and over and over again until it doesn't work anymore, and then you... Start um, the whole process over again. <laughs> that is running a business. If anybody tells you anything different, they're lying to you. Our first failure in business really started as soon as we started the business. So this failure came when we were still living in North Dakota, when we had just started our business. We had some friends that requested this really pretty writing desk. And at the time, the style was farmhouse. Remember when farmhouse used to be the trend? Some people still haven't gotten the memo that it's not. Back when farmhouse was huge in like 2015, 2016, we built this little writing desk and a couple of our friends bought one and it went right in their entryway. They used it as sort of a drop table. Like you come in, you set your bag down, put your shoes underneath it. And that's what they were using it for. And because a couple of our friends bought one, we thought surely the rest of the world would want one too. So I, guys, we spent weeks trying to figure out how I would make a hundred of these things. <laughs> It was so funny. It was made out of pine, uh, just construction grade lumber from Lowe's. We just thought we would sell hundreds of these. So I got the plan all optimized and I knew how many two by fours and two by sixes I needed to buy to make like a hundred of these. We had the spreadsheets, numbers were flying everywhere. Again, we're nerds. Like we had all this stuff figured out and we just thought like, okay, if I figure out how to build it, they will come. Just build <laughs> it and they will come. Not how it happened. So we listed this item for sale and crickets, nobody bought anything. And we thought, okay, well, you know, people just don't know. People just don't know. What did we do? We made some flyers, our very first piece of marketing for this piece of furniture. We made little flyers and we put them in people's mailboxes. We Which put is them illegal, in by the way. You can't just... But yeah, we, you live and learn. Now we know. We don't put flowers I mean, in people's mailboxes anymore. <laughs> I'd do it again tomorrow, but technically... <laughs> you're not supposed to you're do You're not it. supposed to do that. Anyway, so we went around and put flyers in probably 40 people's mailboxes. And we're like, wow, we made so much headway. 40 people now know about this table. That means we're at least going to get like 15 to 20 sales, right? No. We were crushed by this failure. The first big lesson we learned in this business was that you cannot just build something and hope it sells. Um, you can't just throw something up on Facebook Marketplace and expect people to just claw over each other to get it. When you build something and when you make something, there's an expectation that other people will see how cool it is too. And it just doesn't work that way. You got to tell people how cool it is. You got to show them how cool it is. Mm -hmm. And that was something that we really just ignored. We just thought that if we made something good enough, it would stand on its own and sell on its own. And that's just not how it works. Because we're a couple of nerds. We are not <laughs> business people. We are so miserably bad at business. We, literally, our job with the Air Force is we fly through hurricanes for research. And yeah, that sounds cool and everything. But really, all we're doing is staring at a spreadsheet of data as we're bouncing through the hurricane making sure all the numbers are correct. Nerds do not make great business owners. But we're sure trying. <laughs> so the biggest lesson for us in that failure, you have to spend two or three times as much time and energy selling the item as you do building it. And that's a lesson that we've carried with us for years now. That is the most important lesson I think we've ever learned is that you need to spend two to three times the effort and the time marketing and advertising is and selling as you do building 
And I know that's crushing to some of us because we love the building. We just want to stay in the shop all day right. and just build, but that's not how you run a business. That's... That can only be where a third of your time goes, honestly. Now it's time for the second failure. Fast forward a few years. We had gotten our dream jobs with the Hurricane Hunters. We had packed up and moved out of North Dakota down to Houston, Texas. We were excited to start the business over again with all of this knowledge we had. We had learned that we needed to respect advertising and marketing and selling way more than we ever had in North Dakota. We had launched our first product, which was our cutting boards. We were so excited. We saw a need in the market for a better uh, corporate gift. Uh, it was also a really good strategy for us because we could sell to business owners that have a good network of clients and customers. That way we could leverage that because we didn't know anybody in the new city. And we thought if we could knock it out of the park for real estate agents or other people that give corporate gifts, uh, we would get a lot of introductions to people in the city. So we had our product. It was gonna be this awesome cutting board and luxury packaging, and we started selling it to real estate agents. And it worked pretty well. We got in front of real estate agents, they saw the value in it, and they bought a couple from us. And then they stopped. They didn't buy any more. They bought maybe one board and then we never heard from them again. So our issue was that they would buy one board and then forget about us, which kind of makes sense. They had no real reason to stay tied to us. They had purchased a board, given it to a client, and now what? So one of the things we learned about selling to real estate agents is that they are insanely busy. And depending on them to remember to check out with us a couple of days ahead of a closing so that the board got there on time was adding another task for them to do. That just makes more work for them. And us, honestly, to have to remember to reach out to them before every closing or on a routine basis just to make a one $99 sale, kind of ridiculous. And we were scared. We were like, well, like, do we call them like once a week to see if they have closings? We were really confused as to what to do because we didn't want to upset our current customers, but at the same time, they weren't continuing to buy from us. We didn't want to be a bother. We are very polite, uh, kind of quiet people. We don't want to get in the way. We didn't want to call them too many times or send them too many emails. Didn't want to be pushy, but it got to a point where they wouldn't remember us and we needed to do something. I tried what I considered bothering them. I called them twice a week to see if they needed boards or if they wanted to buy a bulk order. I would call them twice a week, every week. I would send them emails and text messages. And to my absolute surprise, they were not bothered. They thanked me for following up with them so often. They said, thank you for staying on me. Thank you for texting me. Thank you for your phone calls and your voicemails. And I could not believe it. If I, I were in so their position, mad. I would be so bothered. But if you have a good product that solves a problem for them, they don't think you're bothering them. So a lot of times we've heard a lot of you in the comments and the stud stack and, and other places, people that have expressed interest in something that you make and the sale never goes through because we feel like we're bothering them if we follow up on them. Believe me, if, they're, if you're bothering them, they'll tell you. They'll say, hey, I'm not interested anymore. Thank you, but I'm not interested yep. anymore. And that's when we learned that you're not bothering your customers by forcing them to say yes or no. That's sort of the lesson that we took away is get a hard yes or a hard no from every person that express interests to you. If you're bothering them, they'll tell you. And you say, hey, sorry about that, appreciate it, and move on to the next person. But I can honestly tell you, I have only had people say that to me maybe a total of three or four times. We've, and sold, I have... we've sold 1,200 <laughs> boards and she's only heard you're bothering me three or four times. That's literally it. You know what I've heard more than stop bothering me? I have heard, would you like to come be a real estate agent at my brokerage? Because nobody else follows up like you do. <laughs> that's, that's what I've heard more than please leave me alone, you're bothering me. So the biggest lesson for us is that you're not bothering your customers. If you're legitimately trying to help them and solve a problem for them with your product, which is what every entrepreneur sh should do, if you're legitimately doing that, you're not selling snake oil, you can bother them until they flat out tell you no. But again, we're quiet nerds. We don't want to talk to people. What, are you kidding? I don't want to talk to people. Our reserved and quiet, polite nature is not going to help us get ahead in business. Being quiet and polite and reserved was one of our biggest failures. As soon as we stopped doing that, we started making some actual money. 
follow your fears, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, which brings us to the third failure because we started finding a lot of success with these real estate agents, right? We were selling boards left and right. Uh, at this point, we had probably sold four to 500 boards. Mm -hmm. And we thought, okay, we need to branch out into other industries. And we thought, well, we're already selling them to real estate agents, but you know, somebody's got to build the house, right? Everybody involved in the real estate process makes a lot of money. And so we thought the people that built the homes, the home builders would also want to give a gift. Yeah, of to the, course, to the, why not? Yeah, the people that are buying new construction homes, it's a bit of a risk that you want to say thank you. Um, so Jenny reached out to just about every single home builder in the Houston area. And what happened? None of them are interested. None of them cared. None of them gave gifts. None of them wanted to give gifts. They felt like they did enough work building the home and that's where it ended. And we thought, well, this is crazy. Like they're making a lot of money off these people. They want their friends to set, they're always asking for referrals. Like every home builder is like, tell your friends, move in with your, there's like billboards all over Houston. And it's like, tell your friends to move with you. Like what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you and your friends to buy all the houses on a street. And anyway, it's just crazy. Like they need referrals and we have the world's best referral tool and they didn't want it. I literally had email conversations with some of these builders that would go on for like 30 or 40 emails back and forth of them deciding whether or not they wanted to use the gift and me trying to convince them with all my might and all my sales skills that they need these boards and they should see the value in these boards. And they just didn't. And the lesson that took us two months to learn there was that trying to change someone's mind in order to buy your product is a less profitable strategy than just looking for the people who already see the value in it. Mm -hmm. For all you other woodworkers out there, I would not try to find customers on Facebook Marketplace because people on Facebook Marketplace are looking for a discount. They're looking for a $10,000 piece of furniture that they can get for $300. The, by going on Facebook Marketplace, they're looking for a deal. You're not finding customers that want to spend good money on furniture, which is why so many of you express your frustrations when you get into the stud stack and you say, why can't I sell anything on Facebook Marketplace? It's because you're looking in the wrong place for your customers. And you're gonna have to do the work to convince that person that your table is actually worth $2,000, not 200. Sales is helping, it's not convincing and you can't help somebody that doesn't want what you have. These boards, we don't need to convince people to use them. We just need to find the people that already see the value in giving a gift, already see the value in getting referrals and taking care of their customers, and we'll sell more boards that way. And the last failure. This one is pretty recent, so it kind of stings a little bit to talk about, but again, we want to keep it real with you guys. A couple months ago, Samara Table Company released its first line of tables. We've built custom projects before, but as far as like building tables for the public and launching them at scale, we did our first run and we sold zero tables from that. We were feeling pretty confident. We were selling, <laughs> we had just sold a thousand boards. We were on top of the world. We thought, yeah, now we're ready. We can sell tables now. We've learned enough from the boards that now we can build what we really want, which are tables. And so we took a prototype picture. You guys watch us build this table last year. Um, and it was a beautiful, modern, sleek table that would be around for years because it was so versatile. Yeah, it was timeless. It didn't follow any one trend. It was gonna stay beautiful for decades. And we had this whole strategy of how we were gonna sell it. But instead of selling to the general public, we were gonna try to sell to interior designers. Jenny's been making a lot of friends with interior designers here in Houston. And we decided that that was the, the market that we wanted to go towards because those are the people that spend high dollar amounts on furniture. And I called up my very first interior designer to see if they would be interested in purchasing one. And they said that they did not like the design. They said it was ugly? Well, they didn't say it was like ugly. The table was simple or not a design that they were looking for right now. So politely they said it was ugly and they didn't want it. They were very polite. I'll put it that way. I thought that was a beautiful table. So did you guys. Yeah. When we delivered it, the, the wife Cry. She, she yes. loved it so much. I'm just so emotional. This is awesome. This is beautiful. Gorgeous, modern, sleek, simple, just not what the interior designers here in Houston wanted. And that was the big failure, was we just assumed that because we liked it and that 
the people we had sold it to before liked it. And a whole bunch of other people had told us that they liked it. We just thought everybody liked it. And that's not the case. These interior designers are very, they have high standards. And very interesting taste. I'll be polite. If they're going to be polite, I'll be polite. <laughs> they have very unique requirements for what they're looking for. And if something is too simple or... Doesn't have some sort of very artsy, creative focal point. Then they're just not interested. And we were sort of naive going into that industry, assuming... We just thought that because we like the table and because our past customers like the table, that these interior designers would like the table. And that's where... We learned the lesson that we have to separate our own opinion from the opinion of the customer. I hate this saying, you'll, you know the saying, the customer is always right? That comes from the fact that you have to understand that the customer's perspective is the only thing that matters because you're after the customer's money. And a lot of times that opinion is gonna change depending on the industry you go into. If we were trying to sell these tables more to the general public, it probably would have gone over better because the general public liked them. But we needed to spend more time figuring out what the interior design world really liked. This table launch led us to a few sales, but not of the table that we were looking to sell. But once again, we learned we need to separate our own likes and desires and what we think is good from what the customer thinks is good because we after the customer's money. You take the man's money, you play the man's game. <laughs> Running a business is not about what you want to do anymore. It's about what the customer wants you to do. So we went back to the drawing board, quite literally, and we're going to try again. We've got a brand new design. We did way more research. And because we had this first failure with the table drop, we learned so much. And I think that this next design will be the winner. But you'll have to stay tuned and we'll let you know how it goes and you'll actually get to watch us build the whole thing. And we hope that by watching this you can see that failure is not weird in starting or running a business. It is not abnormal. It is actually the most normal thing that occurs in business. So if you're trying to start your own or you've been running one for two, three, five, ten, twelve years, the failure and the lessons learned never really stop. So you're not weird. It's not that you're running the world's worst business or doing it the world's worst way. It's just that you're running a business and that's how it goes. And if you want a group of friends that know and understand that to help keep you encouraged, join the Stud Stack. That's our private Discord server of business owners who make and sell things. And they're going through the same feelings of doubt and frustration that we are. Our group therapy session is the last Sunday of every month. So sign up or don't. Either way, I gotta go make lunch. So, see you guys on the next Ask one. Me how I do it, I just stick to the